John, so excited that you uh, decided to hang out with us today, man. For the audience who may not be familiar with you, uh, tell us who you are and what you're up to these days. Yeah, thanks, Jared. Uh, I'm an author and a therapist, live in Colorado. I've got an organization here that uh, nonprofit that does a lot of work with men and women too, called wildatheart.org. And our kind of bread and butter is we do uh, conferences, retreats, uh, podcasts, mm -hmm. where we just talk about becoming wholehearted men and women. Yeah, that's awesome, man. You've been doing that a long time. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think we celebrated our 20th anniversary last year around this time. So yeah, wow. 21 years at this fall. Yeah. That's incredible. That's awesome, man. Uh, I don't normally do this, um, but I'm uh, for some reason, as I was just praying for our time together, uh, I just felt pressed to ask you how you're doing just overall. I know you're probably used to doing a lot of interviews and, oh, thank and all that you. stuff, but man, I just, I felt pressed to ask you how, how you're doing like today at this very moment. Oh, very kind, very kind. Jared, I, I am aware that, so I literally just sent an email to somebody apologizing for forgetting something. And I said, I think I have pandemic brain. Mm. I can feel the overall effect of the global crises and the heartache and the disappointment of people's lives. I, it affects me. Things mm. like that affect me. I'm a pretty mm -hmm. empathetic guy mm -hmm. and I'm a little beat up. The quarantines and the world and the politics in the US and I just, I can feel a little like I've been through the wash and dry cycle. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that, you know, I've read many of your books and uh, it seems like there, you kind of have a personality where you like to break away and uh, just kind of refuel personally. Yes. Uh, maybe some introvert, you know, that's maybe how you refill the tank. Uh, I relate to that in many ways. And so as the, at the time of this recording, we're, you know, a little over a week and a half away from a presidential election, which causes all kinds of noise in our, uh, you know, ears and social media feeds and on the radio and things like that. And for me personally, I have a tendency to just want to like pull, pull away completely, like just kind of go into my cave, right. put, some, put some headphones on and, and it really sucks the life out of me. And I, I think I'm still, I haven't quite processed all of why I do that. Um, and mm -hmm. what I'm trying to protect in myself. For some reason, I just felt, man, to just ask you. Well, <laughs> you, you know what, Jerk, because this conversation is helping the people, you know, the guys who are listening, that's not all bad, pal. Like, mm. we need to unplug. The human soul is not meant to carry the chaos of the world. You're just yeah. not. And yeah. this weird thing has gotten in, particularly to young men in your audience, you know, kind of that age group. That if you're going to be a responsible person these days, you are in the know. Mm. And, and you, you know what's happening with Biden, with Trump. You know what's going on with human trafficking. You're aware of what's taking place and injustice. And, and I'm here to tell you as a therapist, that is crazy. Mm. Like you can't. And you can't. And the human soul was never meant to carry the heartache of the world. But there's, there's kind of this weird thing that we'll know, like a responsible person is, is like very dialed in and up to date on the news and listening, you know, to the latest crises. And, you, you know, you're aware of uh, where your chocolate's coming from, where your coffee's coming yeah. from, where you, right? Yeah. All that. I just got to tell folks, like the idea of detaching, the idea of unplugging, turning the phone off, putting the headphones on, taking the walk, getting out on the you know, bike ride or whatever is really, really good. Like yeah. that's, that's smart to take yeah. care of your soul like that. Yeah. I, you, you've written before about this in, in numerous, you know, variations of your writings, but uh, one of the things that I love and I've always resonated with you, even from as a real young man uh, is you really encourage people like you want to experience Jesus go outside and oftentimes the places that we are looking for Jesus, for example, that maybe the church or church service, you know, um, maybe not be the place that we actually find Jesus. And some of the times the most life-giving places 
or when we go outside the house. I'd love for you to kind of unpack that more because I think people maybe now more than ever might feel, especially for a lot of it, like in Portland where we are, we can't even go to a church service. So maybe those places that you've always thought, this is where I'm going to kind of refuel my spiritual tank uh, aren't even an option anymore. Yeah. So, So what does it look like to try to find Jesus in the maybe mundane or ordinary life uh, yeah. that we're going through right now. Yeah. One of the things that really began to break through intimacy with Jesus for me was the realization that God is in the things you love. Mm. And the reason that you love those things, whether it's music or cooking or, you know, getting takeout with friends and going to the river or, you know, it's cycling, it's, it's your motorcycle, whatever. God yeah. is in the things you love. Yeah. And yes, he's at church and yes, he's in those fellowship contexts too. And I think that inter- human interaction is super important, but you have permission to have a spiritual life outside of church. Mm because 99.99% of your life takes place outside anyway, yeah. <laughs> those contexts, right? Yeah. Like we're, that's an hour a week, maybe, you know, to go now, eh, eh, you know, we were talking about soul care earlier and like, it's okay to not always be plugged in and it's important to unplug. When you are in the things you love, it's art, it, it's creativity, it's reading, you know, it's, when, when you are in the things you love, God is there mm. because he created your heart that way. He, he, he wired you that way. Yeah. And, and there's a special intimacy in that. And so for me, you know, as I'm out on my mountain bike or, or as I'm walking the dogs or whatever, and I see the autumn colors to just pause and go, oh, Father, I, I love you. Thank mm. you for the beauty of this moment. Thank you for the joy in this. You know, mm. you're in this. That is a wonderful way to deepen your life with God. Yeah. One thing that I've talked about a lot with guys is, you know, I, I worked in the church world for a while. And one thing that we often do in the church world is we talk to guys and we say, you know, like, let me invite you into this greatest adventure of all time. God is redeeming the world back to himself. He hasn't given up on humanity, but he's pursuing humanity and making all things new again. This is just the greatest adventure you could ever be a part of, you know, sign up. And and then you find maybe in the crowd, a couple guys are like, all right, I'm in, you know, let's do it. This sounds good. I need some adventure in my life. Uh, and then we, and we say, oh, great. Can you like pass the communion? Or can yep. you help set up chairs on Sunday? Yeah, that, we need you in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I just yeah. can't help but think, man, the church has done a lot of disservice to men whose hearts are just yeah. hungry to be a little bit scared, scared for like the right reasons, right? Like not scared yeah. because they're having an affair or because they're looking at pornography, but scared because God's calling him into something that's way bigger than themselves. And uh, I guess I just wonder how many times guys are just like, or I guess the church does a disservice and we don't invite guys into the right adventure. And we've never given them the yeah. permission to what you just said. Like maybe yeah. God is there when you're at the river and you've got a fishing pole on your hand or you're shooting a yeah. gun or you're on a bike ride or you're with your friends having a good meal. Like, yeah. um, I guess, yeah. What would you say to that? Yeah. The, oh, this is crucial, Jared. Cause I, I can feel what's happening in the conversation is where we're, we're giving men permission. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about adventure because adventure is food for the masculine soul. Mm. It's uh, you look at little boys and if you want to have a good time with little boys, you make an adventure, yep. right? You, you build the fort downstairs, you climb the tree, you get the sled out and you do the highest hill, right? Yep. It's adventure. And as men, we lose that. And then, and then we wonder why we feel empty and restless inside and, and then our addictions and stuff become more interesting to us. So adventure is food for the masculine soul. And there's different levels of adventure, right? So there's casual adventure and that's getting out in the morning for a run. That's, that's getting on your road bike and, and doing 60 miles. That's, you know, casual adventure, easy to get to, nourishing, you know, it's your weekend stuff. 
But then there's higher levels that I think God does invite men into. And, and, and if we will listen, he is inviting us, hey, I got a new job for you. Mm. Hey, I, I, gotta, I, gotta, I want you and your wife to consider having children or adopting. I, ha- I have an adventure for you. And he does. He takes us into these higher level risks. And it's always risk taking. Yeah. And, and what kills a guy is when he tries to create a risk free life. Mm. I, got, I got my life buttoned down, got my career, got my family. We're, you know, church is, is really regular. You know, I've got all that figured out. And then he has an affair, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, because there's no adventure in his life. We, mm-hmm. you, you don't want a life that has no risk to it. Yep. Like, w- what's your frontier, guys? Where is God calling you out to a higher level of risk? Yeah. I've always said bored men are dangerous men. Uh... Right? <laughs> or men in danger. Yeah, that's a good way of saying it. They are men in danger, right? Yeah. How much of this is in line with your, you know, the one of your best-selling books, Wild at Heart? You know, what what kinds of for the guys who aren't familiar with that? What what's kind of the premise of that? Yeah, yeah. So the premise of that is you don't just have a soul; you have a masculine soul. Mm. So Genesis one, God creates us in His image, male and female. He created them. So there's there's a masculine soul inside of you guys. And, and you're not just a person, you're a man. And you have very unique desires. Yeah. And what, what we talk about, in, in, what I talk about in the book is adventure is one of them. Adventure is food for the masculine soul. You're wired for it. Battle is another. Every man is wired for a battle. What does and, that look like I, for a guy? Who's, yeah, okay. You know, so this he's is an so accountant crucial. at work. You know, what's a battle look well, like for that guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, so um, let's start with little boys first, right? They 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 want to be Jedi knights, right? Yeah. And you know, they want to dress up as Spider Man and and all that. Like that heart of the boy wants to be the warrior. He wants to be the hero. There's something deep in men that we want to win. We don't want to lose. Okay. Mm. And like, that's a good thing, guys. Like, mm. like that desire, like you get on the court and you just want to crush it. You want to crush it. You want to whack that little white ball in the kingdom <laughs> come when you're on the, on the tee, right? That's a good thing. That heart of the warrior in us, because most of the things you want in this life, you're going to have to fight for, you know, friendship for men. That does not come easy. Yeah. You, you have to fight for it. And intimacy with your kids and kind of figuring out like their vibe and where they're at because they're so unique you're gonna have to fight for that yeah. and and then we start getting deeper into things like dreams the dreams you have for your life the, the, the career you wish you had the man you wish you were you're gonna have to fight for that mm. and, and so men need adventure but they also need something else that I, that I call like battle they, they need mission. Mm. purpose right they and and the permission to say you are a warrior god wired you that way and and the development of that courage and resiliency and resolve that you see you know it takes the warrior to finish your phd it takes the warrior to leave your current job that's safe and start that company you've been thinking about. Mm-hmm. You know, it, t- it takes the warrior to set some boundaries uh, with your in-laws. And, and you can see that every time you go, you know, your wife just gets creamed, you know, when she's in the, the, the you know, the family setting and you go, you know what, this, this Christmas, we're not going. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll, I'll be happy to, to write that email or make that phone call. It takes the warrior, mm-hmm. right. To do that. And, and, and then if your kids are not in a good place, your son's fighting with anxiety or whatever, it takes the warrior to enter into that fight with him. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that's a beautiful part of the masculine soul that the world has kind of laughed at. Yeah. How much of it in your experience do you think wives want that? Like want to see the, the warrior side of their husband or 
are they really advocating for? No, I just want you to be safe, man. Just go to work yeah. and make sure the yeah. bills come in and <laughs> get taken care yeah. of. Yeah. Well, let's, let's be kind and let's be fair. She is psychotic because <laughs> she wants both. <laughs> and you're never quite sure which one she wants. I'm probably going to okay? get shut down now that for, as a podcast, people are going to hear yeah. that. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, but, but the, you know, the truth is it's the kind of the daring and the wildness and the little bit of riskiness that draws women to the men that they end up marrying. Mm. But then they want to make him safe. Mm. And then they wonder why five years into the marriage, hey, where did that guy go? Mm. And, and I want to say, well, you sort of emasculated him. You, wow. you, you told him, I don't want you to ride the motorcycle anymore. I don't feel good about it. Let's just go little boys for a minute because marriage is so loaded. So let's yeah. go to little boys. Yeah, yeah. Mothers have this beautiful heart of mercy and protection. And they will, you know, oh, Timmy, don't don't ride your bike so fast. Oh, ooh, don't go over that big hill. Ooh. You know, when the boy wants to learn how to, you know, do jumps on his bike, does he ask mom or does he ask dad? Right. He's a dad. Right. Dad, dad, oh, come dad. with me. Yeah. <laughs> dad, let's. Yeah. You know, yeah. show me how to do this. So. There's a natural, beautiful part of the mother's heart to keep her boy safe. But he will not develop into a man. He won't develop courage and resiliency if you keep him safe all his life, right? You mm. can't keep him in bubble wrap. Right. And so the mother, the mother knows that she's got to let go. She knows she's got to say yes. Okay, you can climb that tree. Okay, yes, we can get the trampoline. Okay, it, right? All that. Yeah. I'm, la I'm laughing. The... Nobody can see this because, you know, it's we're on video here. Uh, it, they're going to be listening to the audio. Le yesterday, just, I mean, less than 24 hours ago, I had forwarded a link to my wife about a trampoline. Like, babe, please, let's get, let's get our kids yes. a trampoline. And she said, no, like, don't want a trampoline. They're going to break bone. My wife's a nurse too. So she's just like, no right. way. And I'm right. just like, man, the kids need this kind of stuff. They, I'm, I'm playing this it. podcast for her. They need it. But, uh, and, and I would say back to kind of playing my therapist role for a minute that the overprotective lifestyle that came into parenting in the last, mm, you know, 15 years, I think has led to a lot of the anxiety disorders that we're seeing in teenagers. Mm. Because I think about my, so when I grew up in the 60s and 70s in LA, there were no cell phones. Right. And we would get on our little BMX bikes and we'd be gone for hours. Yep. And our parents had no idea <laughs> right. where we were. Right. Right. And and nobody got abducted. And no, you know, like, yep. it, and if you got hurt, you know, there was somebody you could call, you know, and, and Timmy's mom would call Johnny's yep. mom. And then, yep. you know, we, we allowed our children a level of, what I would call reasonable risk taking mm. that we have totally removed today. But folks, you, it, it, I think we know now. Okay. So here's another fascinating fact in the mental health world. Uh, some of my friends are telling me that the mental health services in universities are overwhelmed in the first several weeks of the freshman year by young students coming in and and not having the resiliency mm. that they need and they literally the quote that one of these phd uh, friends of mine share with me he said he said uh, 18 is the new 12 like there is a there's an emotional immaturity in these freshmen that we're seeing and they can't and and, and they were overwhelmed our the, the the college mental health offices are overwhelmed and what we want to do is build resiliency into our kids. Yeah. And in order to build that resiliency, you have to let him get the mountain bike. You have to let, you know, let the little girl, you know, take the canoe class or she wants to do kayaking or she, you know, whatever it is, she wants to do the flips in the gym class or, yeah. you know, the parallel bars or whatever. And you go, that is a good thing. Mm -hmm. That is a good thing. Don't overprotect because you want to build resiliency in the child so that when they face the bigger battles of adolescence, 
and young adulthood, they, they have a strong heart. Yeah. They have a strong soul. Yeah. I was, well, I was going to ask you, you know, what, what happens if we fast forward from the, the nine-year-old who's not allowed to jump on the ramp? What does that look like? But you answered that, you know, he's the 18 year old who ends up in a counselor's office because he's completely yep. overwhelmed. You know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and this isn't criticism. I understand parents desire to protect. I really do. We're in a different world now where I think uh, cell phones are okay. I think being able, you know, for your kid to be able to call you after school and say, hey, I need a ride. That's all okay. We live in a different hour now. But as parents, we have to recognize that resiliency is only developed through challenge and risk-taking and, and to be honest, hardship. Yeah. And we've just worked really hard to make life comfortable for our kids. Yeah. I was going to ask you, what do you think shifted? You know, like, cause even for me, um, I'm in a different generation than you, but I was riding my bike around. You know, my mom didn't know where I was as I was right. spending hours with, I had no cell phone. Right. So, um, what shifted in that short period of time from my mom having me to now me, you know, and my peers wanting to protect our kids. So much? is it the information? Is it yep. now we're reading the stories about kids yep. being abducted and try, you know, you think yep. that's it? Yeah. GMI. Yeah. We, we, we got inundated because there's actually no more abductions now than there were 30 years ago. Right. The, re the research doesn't hold that up, but we know about them. Right. And honestly, like one event in one household makes the national news. And then we think, oh, you know, it's in every neighborhood. And it, yeah. yeah, it's fear that the too much information. So here's a fascinating thing. Robin Dunbar, a uh, British anthropologist, is famous for a, a number. It's called Robin uh, Dunbar's number. Mm. And, and Dunbar's number is, he looked at the size of the cerebral cortex of human beings, and he looked at the size of villages down through the ages. And he said, human beings are made to live in a community of people of about 150. Mm. And so you're meant to know about the heartaches and the struggles and the joys and the, and the you know, the trials of about 150 people. And I don't mm. mean intimate friendships, you know, I just mean, you know, like a church community or, or you yeah. know, a small town. But now we're getting all the data of, of all the world and it has brought in fear. Mm. It, it's, it, we, we know too much. Yeah. And, and, and the fear has come in. My my poor kids. So I, I have I have uh, sons in the age group of your audience, and they have young children, and and they are so inundated with with all this new parenting information, and it's overwhelming. Yeah, it is overwhelming. It's completely overwhelming. I mean, if I Google right now parenting books, or you know, go on Amazon, uh, I'm going to get fifteen thousand results, and yeah. And then they're conflicting. And not only that, not only just on Google, but, you know, if I swipe through social media, I've got yep. 15 people telling me how to raise my kids uh, yep. or statistics about kids. Yeah. Green time, food, you know, yep. <laughs> all yep. this stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. You know, the connections between uh, nutrition and autism and suddenly, <gasps> You yeah. know, pan, you know, the fear comes in of, oh my gosh, we're letting our kids, you know, eat cheeseburgers. We're ruining them. We're ruining our children. And it's awful. So I, I actually think one of the kindest things you can do to yourself as a parent is limit your news intake. Yeah. Like you just don't have to know about the heartache of the entire planet. Yeah. It's amazing how um, freeing that is. Let, my wife and I, we just, we deleted uh, our social media accounts. It's weird because I, I have to still post, you know, I have to use probably the wrong word. A big part of running a ministry online is being active online. Right? So I will, uh, I will, I don't know if our listeners know this, but I'll, I'll literally download Instagram, post something on there for the dad tired audience and then delete my Instagram. I do that a couple times a week. And uh, even when I'm on, do that for a minute, I just, it's, it's funny how when you kind of get out of that matrix, you're able to look at it from a different angle. 
But anyway, we just, so we deleted all that. And a lot of our news comes from social media. I don't know what's going on unless I'm, you know, somebody's right. talking about it on social media. And one thing that I, I've noticed here, sorry for my ADD rant here. I'm thinking through a lot of this. this no, this is good stuff. <laughs> a lot yeah. of this out loud. But one thing I noticed was I can become highly cynical of people, uh, just like culture at large. And then you, you jump on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, or Twitter, and you read all these people's opinions, especially in a time like right now when we've got major crises around the world and uh, political elections and all this stuff. So you hear everyone's opinion, and I just start getting real, real cynical. Um, and what's fascinating is, uh, oh, sorry, I'm going to keep processing out loud here. You're going to, sorry, Please, put you, you're put on you roll, buddy. Like, you <laughs> go. <laughs> So, so one of the groups that we're part of is uh, like a local, like a, on Facebook is a local, like our neighborhood group, our, our, our community, our town group, right? Just to, what's, what's going on in our local town. We live in a small town. So when I read that, I'm like super cynical. I'm like, man, these people are X, Y, Z, right? But when you delete that and I, now I'm just interacting with my actual neighbor yes. and I'm going to the grocery store, it's so amazing how different I view actual people <laughs> when I'm not processing through the filter of social media. So I know that was a long tangent. That was me processing all that. No, out loud, it's, a but really man. Good, it's, it's, it's a really good story. You shall know them by their fruit. Yeah. And the research is overwhelming now that the rising rates of anxiety and depression together with envy Mm -hmm. In a one-to-one -one cor correspondence, one-to-one, -one, mm. with how much social media you consume. So there it is, folks. Like, you know, and, and the thing about some of the some of the pieces we're talking about right now, like news intake, media, social media, these are actually lifestyle choices. Yeah. The, the good news is, is if, you know, you're not in a concentration camp. They're not forcing you. Yep. You can choose to go, you know what? I'm just going to cut back on all that. Yep. Uh, we're we're going to just be human beings again and and not try and live at the pace of the smartphone, right? I'm going to going to set some boundaries around all that. And the result is mental health, joy, family time, resiliency. Cynicism, human interaction, like envy, all that stuff is better, you know? Right? It's all better. It's all better. Yeah. And I try to convince myself for a long time. Well, you know, you kind of the classic justifications, all my family lives in California. This is how they keep up. It's like, well, that's really dumb of me to say, honestly, if I want my mom who lives in California to see her grandkids, I can either fly her out to come see the grandkids or we can FaceTime and she yep. can see the grandkids or we can call her and say, Hey, they did this today. Yep. She Facebook is not the, the only bridge to our relationship, you know? Exactly. Um, yeah. And then the fascinating thing that's happened quite recently is the amount of censoring that's been going on on social media. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think we all made the mistake of thinking social media is a public space, but social media is a private corporation. Yeah. And, and just to go, Oh, Whoa, right. Wait a second. Like Facebook isn't like, the only public forum in the world like you can actually call your mom you, yep. you know you yep. you can send pictures it, so we're suddenly realizing social media is not a neutral space right and i and, and i think we all kind of thought it was right um, but but the research effects on it uh, are not good have you read the madness of crowds no oh man Real fascinating. You might you might want to add that to the list, man. That one's a that one's a fascinating one. I won't get into it, but uh, one thing you talk. I'm so I'm I'm finishing up right now. Uh, I'll probably finish it today. Beautiful Outlaw. Oh, uh, so such a great book, man. So what I do is I on Wednesdays my wife takes our we homeschool, so she takes them to a co-op with all the other homeschool families, and I stay home get some work done. I usually put on some noise canceling headphones and uh, clean the house and get work done. And so I'm, I'm oftentimes we'll listen to books. I'm listening to the beautiful outlaw. And um, one of the things you said in there uh, was you talked about how there is a difference between 
Christianity and Christian culture. And uh, I've got a lot of thoughts on that, but I won't say any. I just want to hear what you, if you could summarize that chapter. No, no, no. You can't lay that out like that and then not tell your listeners. Give us a hint. Give us a hint. Uh, well, man, the reason I, uh, I'm so bashful and even bringing it up is because I tried to breach that subject a couple months ago and just got land blasted. Right? Land blasted, man. Um, and there may be some listeners right now who are listening and they were the ones land blasting me. So I'm like <laughs> treading on eggshells here. Um, I, yeah. I don't think, so here's what I'll say. I don't think I, I breached the subject. Well, I think that I shouldn't have processed. So this is kind of a public apology for anyone who's listening, who was mad at me. I don't right think on. that, I don't think that I should have publicly processed that without privately processing that a little bit better. Um, yeah. And, and so I don't think that I came about that the wrong, the right way. That being said, I did try to just ask some questions a, along that yeah. topic. And man, I was, I've been doing this now for five <laughs> years and I've never <laughs> got hit so hard. Uh, uh, I, and I'm a, I'm a personality that, you know, I, I, I take things, criticism and opinions. I, unfortunately, I, they're still shaping my identity. And I'm, I'm working through that with Jesus, but man, that week I was like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Yeah. I want to yeah. give up because it was hard. Yeah. yeah. Oh, pal. I hear you. Okay. Let's come at it from a different direction. We would love to know Jesus better. Yeah. We would, we would love to know Jesus better. That the people that know him best describe him as life. Mm. Right. You have the words of life. Like just mm. to be around you is, is life-giving God. Mm. So we want to know God better. We want to know Jesus better. And it's helpful to point out that most of us, our experience and information about Jesus came to us through Christian culture. Mm. Uh, in, in other words, church experiences, books we read, sermons we listened to, you know, that sort of thing. And to recognize that there's a great diversity of channels. It's like stained glass, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, it might be liturgical. It, it might have a great formality to it, a sobriety to it. It might be super informal, and it's fog machines and and high class, you know, concert level bands. And but those things are conveying to you. They are filters through which your understanding of Christ came to you. Mm. And, and so what we're suggesting is there's Christ and then there's Christian culture, yeah. you know, th that's shaped by human beings and we are all stained glass and we don't get it quite right. And so it's just a healthy thing to go, wait a second, maybe, maybe that Bible college I went to, you know, they had one take on Jesus, but maybe, maybe there's more to him than I thought, you know? Yeah. Here's one of the really fun ones to open up life with God. Jesus has a sense of humor because humanity does. Yep. And where do we get that? Yep. Like we were created with a sense of humor. There are mm -hmm. things that crack you up. I love that. Even babies, even the, the young ones, you know, it starts yes. so early. Yeah. yeah. You see okay. it. Yeah. You have the ability to crack up. And God gave you that ability, and he enjoys cracking you up. <laughs> and so you look back at the Gospels, and you go, where's the, where's the humor of Jesus? And oh, my goodness, it is all over the place. Like some of the weird things he says or the weird things he does, if you will allow a sense of humor in it, yeah. you go, oh, okay. So John 21, you've read this in the book, but after the resurrection— Guys are at the beach. They're fishing all night. They don't catch anything. They don't know where Jesus is right now. He, he disappeared. And so Peter and the guys go, well, let's go fishing. So uh, classic dude thing to do, right? Uh, so they go to the lake, get in the boat, fish all night, nothing. Christ appears on the shore. But he doesn't say, hey, everybody, woo, over here, it's Jesus. Let's do a Bible study. <laughs> right. He does it. He, it, this is fascinating. He just yells out. He says, hey, how's it going? You know, how's the fishing? Which is what any, 
person walking along the beach who runs into some fishermen asks? Everybody asks that. Right. I'm a fisherman, and I hate it when people ask me because right. everybody asks you, "Hey, how's it going? Right. Catch anything?" You know. Yep. Okay, so he does that, and they're like, he says, "Catch anything?" And they say, "No." One word answer. There's no rapport. You know, they don't. They don't clearly know it's God. It's Jesus, and they're actually a little ter- kind of tweaked at him. Like, who's this joker? You know, on the beach. And he says, hey, why don't you try the other side? Yeah. And I'm like, well, okay. And so they, you know, boom, miraculous catch of fish, which is exactly how they met Jesus three right. years ago. So right. it's an inside joke. It's a playful way of announcing his presence. He's like, yeah, it's me over here. <laughs> you know, it, there is. And so to um, what I'm trying to say to the folks listening is maybe if you allow some playfulness, into your relationship with Jesus, it will open up new levels of intimacy and friendship yeah. with him. Yeah. And, and if playfulness wasn't part of how you learned him, maybe that's not because Jesus is always serious. Maybe that's because it came through a, a culture that didn't allow for his playfulness. Yeah. Well, so just to give, you know, uh, testimony to that being true. I was listening last week, one week ago today, to that, to the, the book, and you were kind of describing all these things. I've been in ministry 15, 16 years, taught the Bible, teaching lots of things. And last week, almost to the hour, as I was cleaning, I was listening to the book, and man, I had to take off my headphones. And I laid face down in my living room and I just started to weep. Mm. And I was just like, man, I had, a, you just um, were able to paint a picture of Jesus. And I just kind of felt like all the things that you described, all those filters that we see him through mm. were, I'm going to, I'll cry if I get to, uh, if I talk about it too much now, man, but uh, I just felt like they were kind of removed. And, um, mm. and I just got a, and I got to see an angle or Jesus from an angle I hadn't seen him before. Mm. I've been doing this a long time, man. <laughs> and uh, and to just see these sides of Jesus that are so beautiful um, that I feel like, man, I still have yet to experience. It It literally yeah. brought me to my face weeping. Yeah. Um, so that's beautiful. That's beautiful. It's a good book, man. For anyone who's listening, I've read, you know, I think all, all of your books and uh, that, it's such a good one. All of them are good, but the, um, that's the one I happen to be in right now. And, it's not the first time you, you know, it's, it's brought me to tears, but this, this was a really powerful healing moment. Um, mm. It's kind of, you know, kind of look back at these, uh, these mm. markers of your life yeah. when you really experience Jesus in a different yep. and new way. Mm-hmm. And that, and that yep. definitely is one of them. Yeah. yeah. And I love your love and, and your language for Jesus because the world is comfortable talking about God. You can use God. Yeah. Because God, anybody can put anything in that box, right? right? It's an empty word, right? Or, or it's a spacious word. It's not empty. It's spacious. People mm-hmm. can put all kinds of things in it. But Hebrews one, uh, I love that introduction because it says, "Yeah, in the past, uh, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets in many ways, but in these last days, He has spoken to us through His Son." Yeah. And then it goes on to say. The son is the exact representation of the father, of God, the almighty. And then, you know, when the guys are on the Mount of Transfiguration and they see Moses and Elijah with them, and these are, these are Jews, right? And they're like, holy cow, it's Moses. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Woo! This is <laughs> unbelievable. It's Elijah. And the father steps in and he says, this is my son. Mm. Listen to him. There is a beauty and a precision to the revelation of God through Jesus that is so important for us to kind of restore to the world right now. It's, it's not, it's not uh, God as you imagine him. Yeah. It, it is Jesus as he reveals the Father. Yeah. And so like his personality and his way. I, I, I just love, thank you for your commitment. Mm to jesus and as opposed to the generic yeah. god yeah 
yeah, I don't know how to answer that other than I'm, you know, um, uh, or respond to that, I should say, other than I'm, I'm just falling in love with who he is. And, and, uh, right. and oftentimes what I'm, I'm, what I see, I'm a young husband and dad. I'm trying to figure this out. I had nobody around to teach me. My dad wasn't around to teach me any of this stuff, which is really how dad tired started. And, uh, and I just have seen the track record has been true that the more I fall in love with the person of Jesus, the better husband I am, the better dad I am over and over and over again. So, yes. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because I love Athanasius's book on the incarnation. And, and he basically says this, he says, Jesus took on our humanity to heal our humanity. Mm. So the more we hang out with Jesus, the more he heals us. Yeah. And so you're, you love better. You're more gracious with your irritating neighbors, you, you know, just all yep. of it. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. R- rubs off. How do you, uh, you've got kids who are grown, you know, and uh, you have grandkids too, right? Yeah. Now yeah, we do grand- little yeah, ones. That's yeah. awesome, man. What would you say to a young dad like me? who we want our kids to experience Jesus. Cause right now we feel like, I think many of us feel like we're in an information giving stage, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah, we just need to teach them. We're going to try to teach them about mm-hmm. God and the Bible and kind of mm-hmm. it's a lot of information about God, but mm-hmm. man, I want, I want my kids to know Jesus. And, yep. and that's what I pray for often. God, I just want them yep. to know and love yes. you. I yeah. even pray, God, I want them to know and love you more than I do. <laughs> Just yeah. please, Lord, right. let them know and love you. But I guess what would you say to yeah. a young dad who wants yeah. that so badly for their kids? Yeah. Tell stories of your life with him. Mm. Tell stories of your life with him. Hey, guys, you're not going to believe it. You know, yesterday I was doing the chores and holy cow, the next minute I'm on the floor weeping. and Yeah. Like Jesus was with me mm. and he, he's so wonderful. Like tell stories yeah. Be, because they're looking at your life far more than they're looking at the sermons or the lessons or the Sunday school classes or whatever. And then the second thing I'd add is this. One of the great lost treasures of the Christian faith is learning to hear the voice of Jesus to you personally. Mm. And John 10, 10, he's very, very clear. My sheep hear my voice. He says it four times. And the entire, the entire Bible, Old Testament and New, are simply stories of people who have a friendship with God. Yeah. God speaks to them. He speak, they speak to him. It's, it's two-way, right? And children don't have the filter yet that, quote, God doesn't speak to me. Mm. They don't have that filter. So you can do fun little playful encounters of, as a family of, well, let's ask God. Should we go out for, for burgers tonight? Like, let's ask him and see what he says. You know, mm. I heard God say yes. You know, <laughs> it's awesome because then they mm. realize, oh, he's he's talking to me. Yeah. Not just my dad or my mom, you know, or or a priest or pastor or whatever. He's talking to me. Yeah. And and they children can hear the voice of, of God far more easily than adults. And so cultivate that in your family. Like we, mm. that was one of the things we brought into our family culture. And it, we made it as normal as dinner time. Like mm. it was just, we'd be sitting around talking and, and somebody would say, hey, I'm just not sure if I should X, Y, or Z, you know, go to Timmy's for the sleepover or whatever and go, well, let's ask Jesus. Mm. And, and, and then let them hear, let them, and because it, it, oh, it opens up this wonderful um, adventure yeah. for them of God speaks to me. Mm. I love that, man. Unfortunately, we're running out of time here and I, I didn't get to like <laughs> yeah, 75% of the things <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about. I guess, man, if you, if you could just like final exhortation for the young dad, he's tired. Yep. He turned on this podcast because he's trying his best to figure out what does it mean to lead yep. my family to Jesus? I don't even yeah. know if I'm in love with Jesus and I'm trying to point my family. Yeah. How do you encourage that dad? Yeah. I, I want to say two things. I want to say you're doing a great job mm-hmm. and your kids are going to be fine. 
that that is what a father says to a young man. Mm. You're doing a great job and your kids are going to be fine. And it's when we parent out of that place mm. that we're not parenting out of fear. And, and most of the fear is around us. Like, I suck at this. I'm blowing it. I'm missing important moments. Wow, I just totally wounded my kid. He's never going to recover from that. Nope. 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 You are giving them the greatest gift in the world. You're giving them a dad. Mm. That's phenomenal. Way to go. Man, you're... Uh... I'm trying not to get choked up, but that's, that's an encouraging word, man. John, you, I, I can't recommend highly enough. Everybody goes and gets all of your books. Um, they're all going to help you get closer to Jesus. But thank you for carving out some space to encourage us and playing that role of a sage for a minute for us, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, I loved it. Let's do it again sometime. Yeah.